Holly Haynes, Assistant Professor of Classics, New York University. It's wonderful to be here and hear so many perspectives on Seth's life. Um, many people here this afternoon have attested to the genius and generosity of Seth as a teacher and a scholar. Um, I want to say just a few things about him as my friend. I got to know Seth at the beginning of my second year here at NYU because we were both in the office all weekend, every weekend. <laughs> he took everything I said seriously and he didn't seem to mind about my bad Latin and Greek. Consequently, I spoke freely with him and didn't feel I had to hide anything. To Seth, I always told the truth. As a result, I learned from him a self-knowledge I never had before, namely the ability to have a good time in life. He advised me to write and think what I wanted and to buy wickedly expensive shoes because they were beautiful and I loved them. <laughs> It's impossible to have a good time in your life if what you don't know causes you anxiety. Unfortunately, in our profession, hiding what you don't know becomes a second nature, especially when you are as young and clueless as I was when I first met Seth. But from him, I discovered that not to know is a great state, and I felt clever for the first time, because I'm here to tell you that I had done a lot of not knowing by then. <laughs> And it seemed that this new attitude Seth showed me suddenly spun the dross of my life into gold. As my friend, he simply refused to believe that I ever felt intimidated or depressed or humiliated by my work and saw in me and made me see too pleasure, joy, and freedom of expression. He was the first person I ever met for whom shoe shopping and thinking about Parmenides held equal delight. <laughs> Once, when I went to consult him about a problem with which I had wrestled for a long time and an arduous time, he proposed that the solution must lie with a completely different author and that a completely different set of questions must first be asked. I flung myself to the side of my chair and, and whimpered. Now, no whining, Seth said, exactly as if he were addressing a fussy child. And it struck me as so funny that I laughed really hard and really loudly. Seth laughed too, and we both grew quite hysterical for a time. Seth thought I had a funny laugh and he liked to provoke it. My main memory of sitting with him in his office is reading and laughing. So I have a hail for Seth, but not a farewell. Because I loved him, I loved my life and stopped being afraid. That laughter, for me, is the link between body and soul, and so I will never be without him. Michael Davis, Professor of Philosophy, Sarah Lawrence College. There were certain times in Seth's classes when questions would uncharacteristically break out. On one particular evening in a course on the Fido in the spring of 1980, it seems so much more recent than that, David O'Brien first asked Benedetti what we were going to do when he died, to which Seth gave a silent but expressive shrug. <laughs> In a follow-up, Mr. O'Brien asked whether it didn't make Seth angry that he would die. To this he replied, no, I've always considered it a privilege to have lived. Now, as with many of the things Seth said, this beautiful remark is both striking and elusive, especially in light of something else he once said. Having begun a sentence with, it's always seemed to me, Seth stopped abruptly and added, my brother Jose has noticed that whenever someone says, it's always seemed to me about something, it invariably means that he's just thought of it. <laughs> Perhaps this uh, was true of his view of life as a privilege for which one ought to be grateful, not a right violated by the uncanny certainty of death. Still, this view is consistent with his much later platonic reading of the Odyssey, and especially with his interpretation of the passage read a moment ago by Michel Lowry. Uh, 
Odysseus, the man of mind, refuses immortality because he understands that there is no mind without soul and no soul without death. This is perhaps the deepest version of what Seth called the teleology of evil. To learn, one must experience or suffer, pathe mathos. This suffering must remain hard, but knowledge of its necessity somehow transforms it. Because to be alive means to die, to be angry about the fact of death means to hate life. Seth was a lover of life, which was for him the love of learning, philosophy. Seth was first a figure of gossip for me. During a year at Heidelberg, I read Plato's Philebus with Tom Schmidt and Richard Velkley. Schmidt, who I believe had heard Seth lecture at Yale, gave an elaborate description of what he called his magnificent head. Later, I would always put this together with the dark, brooding photograph at the beginning of Seth's essay on Greek tragedy. The outside does not always reflect the inside, but Seth's looks somehow reflected his edos, at once daunting and seductive. When I decided to do my dissertation on the Philebus, Richard Kennington, my advisor and a close friend of Seth's, made available to me Seth's course notes on the dialogue. I had looked at most of the literature, and I just finished a seminar on the Philebus with Hans Georg Gadamer, but all of that was nothing compared to Benedetti. He had an uncanny ability to see the profundity lying concealed on the surface of things. Once one understood that the Greek expression katanun, to my mind, meant pleasing, it was clear that in the very first sentence of the Philebus, Plato had already denied the separation of mind and pleasure, which is the dialogue's putative theme. The truth of katanun is that there is no mind without desire, without soul. At Kennington's urging, I sent a copy of my finished dissertation to Seth. He wrote back within the fortnight. He said he had read it with great pleasure, for it was very well written. Indeed, he went on, too well written, given the subject matter discussed. There followed pages of intricate criticism, which I had the humbling experience of simply not understanding. <laughs> Rereading the letter many years later, I began to see what he had had in mind when he spoke of the relation of eros to mind. But at the time, I was perplexed. I was disappointed and, frankly, a little angry. Superficially angry at him, really rather angry at myself. Over the years, I saw others respond as I had. It's very difficult to discover someone who knows what you're supposed to know so much better than you know it. And Seth didn't make it easier, for it was a point of principle with him to converse with others as though they shared his unconditional devotion to getting at the truth of things. He always treated interlocutors as equals, and it was always a lie. <laughs> for he was the intellectual superior of everyone with whom I ever heard him converse. But by way of this noble lie, he made us better than we were. For years, I sat in on his classes at the New School and at NYU, the first seminar on Sophocles Philoctetes in the fall of 1979. It started at 6.10 and usually lasted until 10.30. Then we'd go out afterward to the Cedar Tavern, or in later years to Homer's. Sometimes there were several, several of us, sometimes he and I were alone. The conversation was like nothing I had before experienced. It would usually start with unresolved puzzles generated in the class, then turn to politics or the newest problem in cosmology. We might talk about Heidegger and Strauss, or we might discuss whatever he was reading, the, memo the memoirs of Babur, the great mogul of the 16th, 16th century, or of Mildred Cable, a Christian missionary to Mongolia, or we might talk about Tibetan grammar, or Priscilla Cornwall, Cornwell, or his interpretation of Star Wars, The Wizard of Oz, Rome, Christianity, Judaism, Cervantes, the Arabian Nights, Hades, and at one point or another, every figure in the history of philosophy. <laughs> and of course there was Plato, for Seth the measure of everyone else, and tragedy, the question to which he always returned. His conversation danced with ease over an enormous range, but was somehow never superficial. It was most exhilarating when we circled back to put together these odd pieces into a single whole. Seth and I used to joke about how strange it was <laughs> that in any given semester, semester, the different books we were teaching ended up being about exactly the same thing. <laughs> 
One day during that first year, I was walking to my office with one of my students, intelligent and yet a little presumptuous, as Sarah Lawrence students are wont to be. She asked me what had happened. I didn't know what she meant. Well, she said, I'd been a pretty good teacher the previous year, but something had changed, something in the way I looked at things. I was somehow more alive. She couldn't quite put her finger on it, but she assured me that I had somehow, well, changed. <laughs> I could put my finger on it. I had met Seth Benedetti. After the Cedar Tatter Tavern, when Seth walked me to the subway, the conversation would return to what he had talked about in class. I don't know how many times I had to race through Grand Central Terminal to catch the very last train back of the, the, of the night back to White Plains. I'd get home at 2.30 or so, get to bed by 3, and the telephone would ring. Without so much as a hello, Benedetti's voice would say, I've just discovered this beautiful thing. And the conversation would continue from where we had left off. In later years, we'd walk from Homer's to my car, then I'd drive him home. On one bitterly cold night, we sat for two hours on 12th Street. The conversation had gone back and forth all evening on Republic Book Three. Seth interrupted himself in mid-sentence and, 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 and in that very excited, breathy tone said, wait, 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 could it possibly be? He had discovered the connection between the Kalon, the beautiful, and Thumos, spiritedness, that would prove so crucial for his book, Socrates' Second Sailing. I thought about what he had said all the way home. Somehow it was now our discovery. That night, too, I got a call. While I had been delighting in our discovery, Seth had already reformulated it and pushed it to another level. The following week in class, I had expected to see it triumphantly hold out for display, but he had, transform tra he had transformed it still further so that it was no longer altogether recognizable to me. His books, too, read like this. Most authors pause to sum up what they have accomplished. Seth's writings are so difficult, not because any sentence is particularly opaque, but because of the collective weight that must be borne when every sentence adds something important. He so delighted in discovery because it enabled him to discover still more. The entire world was the object of his wonder, himself only insofar as he was an example of the most peculiar part of it. I first saw Benedetti at a memorial for Leo Strauss. And the first words I heard him utter were, Leo Strauss was a philosopher. Seth never claimed to be a philosopher. He knew the danger of supplanting love of wisdom by love of self. But honesty requires us now to call him that. Drew Keller once asked him if he still thought about Strauss, to which he responded, every day. Benedetti used to tell a story about the public presentation of his master's thesis on the Theages at the University of Chicago. As he was reading it, he periodically heard giggling from behind him, where the members of his committee were seated. Afterwards, Strauss came up to him and said, I didn't know you were such a funny man. <laughs> <laughs> no one else had got the joke. <laughs> Benedetti was the most playful and the most profound man I ever met. In, in him, the two were one. It must surely have been difficult for him that even those of us who admired him most had only a glimmer of their togetherness. For 22 years, it was my privilege to share in a conversation that however staggeringly broad its range, was still one conversation, an ongoing attempt in which nothing was too petty to be considered, to glimpse the true pieces of the world and their mutual connection. Having tasted the sweetness of this conversation, it is hard to imagine life without it and yet hard as well to imagine it without him. So thoroughly have thinking and talking to Benedetti come to mean the same thing for me. Knowing him, being his student, and later his friend, has been the great gift of my life. Seth generally indulged, but did not share my admiration for certain contemporary authors, Saul Bellow, Tom Stoppard, others. I'd like to conclude by reading a passage from one of them a poet that Seth thought interesting, but not that interesting, Wallace Stevens. 